And I just want to say welcome everybody to our second session of the Santa Cruz County ACES Network uh, learning session. This is uh, called Connecting Across Sectors. And I'm Nicole Young. I'm one of the um, co-hosts and, and uh, people that helped plan and, and um, organize today's session. I'm a consultant to First Five and also to Core Investments Santa Cruz County, which is a collective impact initiative here in our county. And First Five is actually hosting this event today um, for the ACES Network of Care Learning Series, um, along with Core Investments. And I'm actually joined today by other members of the Core team that are providing some in-meeting support. So I'm just going to give a quick shout out to uh, those of uh, my colleagues that are helping out with interpretation and admitting people into the meeting. So Nicole Lezen, who is uh, my co-facilitator, co-consultant for CORE, Stella Lauerman, who's providing interpretation today, Maricela Quetzada, who's also providing interpretation, uh, Helacio Gonzalez, who you just heard a few moments ago, is actually, uh, he actually works with the Monterey County Office of Education, but has graciously offered to help out today with both interpretation and uh, helping us monitor the chat in both English and Spanish. Um, several of the first five staff are helping out in various roles today. So again, thank you so much. And we have a team that helped plan and design today's session. Um, that includes David Brody and Christine Seberg from First Five Santa Cruz County, Susan Paradise from the Health Services Agency Public Health Department, and public health is actually the official ACEs Aware grantee um, from the state. And so we're uh, really pleased to be able to working in partnership with the public health department on this. Um, Najib Kamil from the Human Services Department, the Family and Children's Services Division, and then Marisa Lara from the Health Improvement Partnership have all contributed uh, thoughts and, and suggestions and uh, actual hands-on help with um, offering today's session. And again, we're excited to be welcoming back our, um, our guests from the Center for Community Resilience today. And they've um, brought some of their partners, they're building community resilience partners from Portland, Oregon, uh, along with us. And, and they'll be uh, introduced in just a few moments. But for now, I wanna just give you a quick overview of what we plan to cover today. So in a moment, I'm gonna turn it over to David to say a few more welcoming and opening comments and we'll have everybody introduce themselves. And then we'll hear from um, Wendy Ellis and Jeff Hild from the Center for Community Resilience about, about the work that they do and using policy to foster practice change. Um, and then we'll get to hear quite a bit from their partners in Portland, Oregon, again, about how they're using this building community resilience process um, in, in their community. We're gonna have uh, plenty of time for discussion, questions and answers. Uh, we encourage you to share your thoughts in the chat throughout the session. We will be doing breakout groups um, today and we'll explain more when we get to that point how we're going to do it um, to make sure everyone uh, has an opportunity to hear more about a particular topic they're interested in. Um, and then we'll come back for, again, some wrap up, uh, hearing what kinds of insights came out of those breakouts before we wrap up with our next steps and closing. So again, some of you I know are Zoom veterans and um, have you know, got this all down, but I'm gonna do a quick review of uh, some of the key features so you know how to participate today. Again, if you um, are wanting to say something out loud or share something when, when there's an opportunity, you know, press your microphone icon to mute and unmute yourself. If you're calling in on the phone only and you're not using the Zoom app, then you press star six on your phone to mute and unmute. Again, really important because we are offering simultaneous interpretation, everybody needs to select a language channel, um, either English or Spanish. And so look for the globe icon uh, to, to select either English or Spanish. And just remember if you're on the Spanish channel in particular, um, to select mute original audio so that you're only hearing the interpreter and not the English speaker as well. We do encourage you or we appreciate it if, uh, if you're able to figure out how to rename yourself in the participants list. 
that helps us just know what language you're, what language channel you're on. So if you're on the English channel, add the letters E-N-G after your name. If you're on the Spanish channel, add E-S-P for Espanol. If you're bilingual and you think you might be going back and forth, um, add B-I-L. And again, just to make sure everybody knows, we are recording today's session and all the breakout rooms. Um, and so if you really don't wanna be seen or heard um, in, the, in the today's session, you can keep your video off, your camera off and, and your microphone muted. Again, we encourage you to share your questions and comments in the chat throughout the session. And uh, best way to get our attention is to raise your hand to be called on um, just because there are so many people on it, we could easily miss someone. And again, if you're calling in on the phone only, uh, you press star nine on your phone to raise and, and lower your hand. Okay, I think the last thing I'm gonna do before I turn it over to David is just invite everyone to introduce themselves in the chat. So we'd like you to share your name and if there's a particular group or organization that you work with or you're a part of, include that. We know we have people from all different counties and some even different states. And so add your county and state that you're from as well. And uh, see Miguel and Diane and, and Sarah, and now names are starting to scroll really quickly. And so, <laughs> so I won't be able to acknowledge everyone, but, but thank you and, and welcome. It's great to see um, so many people returning again for today's session. So I'm going to hand it over to David now. Great, thank you, Nicole. Um, again, David Brody, uh, Executive Director at First Five Santa Cruz County. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, it's really great. It looks like we have uh, over 100 participants right now. Um, so it's just fantastic to see such a large group that's so um, interested in this topic. Um, we're excited to see uh, that many of you are returning from the second session, uh, for the second session of our ACES Network of Learning series. Uh, and we welcome you, those of you, of course, that are joining us for the first time. Uh, we're pleased to have, again, the Center for Community Resilience, or CCR, and their Building Community Resilience Partners in Portland, Oregon, joining us today, my hometown. Uh, in our first session, held on November 12th, we learned about what Dr. Ellis and her colleagues at CCR call the pair of ACEs, or adverse childhood experiences that are rooted in adverse community environments. Um, CCR uses this image that you see on the screen. Uh, of a tree to describe adverse childhood experiences as the branches and leaves of a tree that will show visible signs of vulnerability and illness if the roots of the tree are growing toxic or are growing in toxic soil or what they call adverse community environments that are lacking equity as measured by concentrated poverty, discrimination, poor housing conditions, higher risks of violence and victimization, homelessness, and overall a lack of economic opportunity and social mobility. Um, these inequitable community conditions uh, are rooted in structural racism and provide little access to support or buffers that support resilience. Next slide, please, Nicole. Um, so some of our key takeaways from our last session were that we needed to tend to the branches and leaves of the tree while also tending to the roots and the soil. Uh, that means as a network of care, we must simultaneously strengthen and sustain our programming partnerships with families, agencies, and community, but also to create connected, equitable systems and supports. Uh, and that requires us to work together to transform programs, practices, and policies across systems in order to address root causes of adversity and achieve racial justice and equity. Next slide, please, Nicole. <clears throat> and so this, of course, aligns uh, very well with our uh, First Five's vision of a healthy, happy, well-prepared children, thriving families, connected communities and equitable systems. Next slide, please. Um, and while First Five's primary focus is on young children, prenatal through age five and their families, uh, we recognize that we must be connected to other partners 
agencies and systems that support children and families across the lifespan, uh, which is why First Five helps lead or participates in many of the collective impact initiatives that are creating structural support for equitable health and well being, not only in early childhood, but across the lifespan. Um, we're showing just a few of those on this slide, some of which you might recognize the names and logos of, like Core Investments, Thrive by Three, uh, Live Oak Cradle to Career, and the Central Coast Early Childhood Advocacy Network, just to name a few. Next slide, please. So the newest collective impact initiative that we're helping lead is our local ACEs Aware effort, um, which is part of the statewide initiative part of a statewide initiative with a mission to change and save lives by helping providers understand the importance of screening for adverse childhood experiences and training providers to respond with trauma-informed care to mitigate the health impacts of toxic stress. So no small charge. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the statewide ACEs Aware initiative is led by California's first ever Surgeon General Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who I might mention also was recently named the chair of the First Five California Commission. We couldn't be more pleased to have her as part of our family as well. Uh, and her colleague, Dr. Karen Mark from the Department of Healthcare Services. Last year, uh, ACEs Aware awarded 100 grants to organizations across California to help increase the reach and impact of the initiative. Um, and there are two ACEs Aware grantees in Santa Cruz County. Next slide, please. One of the grantees is our public health department uh, and they partner with us first five and the health improvement partnership as well as the human services department. And that's what this is kind of the genesis of all this today. Um, the other ACEs Aware grantee in Santa Cruz County is Stanford Children's Health, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Uh, since we have a limited amount of time today, I'm not gonna go into more details about the ACEs activities and other partners, um, but we'll include some information uh, about how to learn more about uh, our coordinated efforts and our follow-up email after today's session. And next slide, please. So First Five's role here is to convene six network of care learning sessions to promote the ACEs Aware initiative, to share best practices, um, and to strengthen the coordination and collaboration among our Medi-Cal provider community and other key partners. Um, serving children and families in Santa Cruz County. Um, our first three sessions, uh, in the second of those now, will feature the Center for Community Resilience, uh, which started again in November, uh, in, 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 with a November session about the pair of ACEs in practice, followed by today's session, connecting across sectors, and then the third session, connecting ACEs, equity, and resilience. Um, we're gonna determine uh, our next two topics after that, based on the feedback and themes that emerged from the first three sessions. Um, and then we'll end with a joint community conversation co-hosted with the Health Improvement Partnership. Our ultimate goal is to transform policies and practices and systems in order to prevent adverse childhood experiences. Uh, and we know that that work extends far beyond the current ACEs Aware grant, but we are certainly leveraging it to help make that happen. So as Nicole mentioned earlier, um, we're co-hosting these sessions with core investments, a cross-sector collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being across the lifespan. Um, this partnership will help us integrate the ACEs learning sessions into other complementary efforts and initiatives. So clearly there is no shortage of great things going on. Um, but with all that said, <clears throat> that's the setup. I'm now pleased to introduce uh, very excited to introduce our, our featured guests from the Center for Community Resilience. Uh, Dr. Wendy Ellis is an assistant professor in global health and the director of the Center for Community Resilience at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University. Um, the Center for Community Resilience seeks to improve the health of communities by enabling cross-sector partners to align policy program and practice and to address adverse childhood experiences, as we've said, in the context of adverse community environments, or as Dr. Ellis has coined it, the pair of ACEs. Jeff Hild is the policy director at the Redstone Global Center for Prevention and Wellness at the Milken Institute School of Public Health. Uh, Jeff works with local, national, and global partners to develop, promote, and advance policies 
to prevent and treat obesity, as well as to build resilient and healthy communities. Um, so with that said, I will turn it over to Wendy and Jeff to tell us more about their work and introduce their building community resilience partners in Oregon and guide us through our discussions today. Wendy and Jeff. Well, thank you so much, David. Um, if we can just go to the map uh, slide, Nicole, on our deck. Um, and by the way, David, you do such a wonderful um, explanation of the pair of aces tree. I feel like you should be on our team. So thank you so much. <laughs> um, so we are the, this, what you're looking at here is the network, the building community resilience or the resilience catalyst networks, which are um, a part of this national movement for that we run out of the Center for Community Resilience at the George Washington University. And you'll see there that these regional um, networks are made up of cross-sector partners, whether that's social and health services or local health departments, local children's hospitals, um, community organizations, uh, as well as city government entities, particularly um, in, in Washington, D.C. and in Dallas, the city of Dallas, the Office of Urban Resilience. There are a number of different partners across multiple sectors that have this shared interest in really addressing the root cause of many of the adversities that we see, whether that's in healthcare, or behavioral health, or in social services. And so it is an all-in strategy, um, thinking about places not only where we can identify um, adversity or the experience of adversity, but also the partners who have a role in addressing those root causes. And so this is the network and much of the work that we'll present to you today is really drawn upon the lessons learned of, of, of these different uh, organizations. And I just noticed in the chat, this is why is there not a partner in uh, California? Well, actually this does not represent the latest uh, rendition of our map. We actually um, do have a partner in uh, California, the Alameda uh, County Health Department, which we just kicked off that work with them. Um, and yes, there's a partner in Florida, Leon County, Florida is one of the newest partners to join this cohort. So um, shame on us, we should have updated this, uh, this map before today's presentation. So let's go to the next slide so you can get an idea of what it is that we do. Uh, so you heard um, or you saw the pair of aces tree and that, that tree um, really has come out of the work that we done with the building community resilience collaboratives and networks where they are implementing our building community resilience process that really focuses on how do we create this shared understanding of the experience of adversity, those pair of ACEs in your community. Who, how can we work across uh, various sectors to address the various needs and community, but working with community to do that. And so the team that is going to present with you today is from a Portland, Oregon, or it's actually a statewide now initiative um, in Oregon that has been using the BCR process now for almost five years to really begin to go upstream to address the pair of ACEs. And so they're a great example of some of that work that um, has been underway using the building community resilience process. Out of that work, um, as I mentioned, you know, it is really the deep dive work in community that helps us to begin to understand that connection between the experience of trauma, the experience of adversity, and oftentimes that link to inequity. And that if we are to be resilient communities, then we do have to foster equity. We do have to identify the specific levers of policy, of practice, of program that perpetuate many of the adversities that are experienced at the community level. And so the many of the things that we've talked about or that you heard in, in the last session, and certainly what we will build upon in this third session, is drawn upon that work of community, doing the deep dive work to understand the experience of adversity, but to also harness community wisdom in the development of solutions and particularly policy solutions. And so that is the policy lab portion of the work that my colleague Jeff Hild will talk about much more, but ultimately our work is around big systems change. 
It's not just about practice change, but it's how do we inform certainly practice change, but from that change itself, how does that inform the policies that we have in place or the opportunity to change policy for long-term change, long-term lasting change? The resilience catalyst work is the work that we're, left, we're very excited about kicking off in the state of California, in Alameda County. And this is where we work with local health departments implementing our community resilience framework that takes a concentrated look at housing, public education, law enforcement, and criminal justice as primary drivers of what we see in the soil of our communities understanding that they are huge contributors to that community environment and thus a very important influence factor in the experience of individual adversity as well as community adversity, but also as a potential solution when we think about the various practice changes, policy changes that could occur if we're working more collaboratively, collaboratively across those sectors. So that's the exciting work that we're really looking forward to um, bringing to Alameda and potentially other communities within California. So the last slide that I have is that pair of aces tree that, you know, I really feel like David did such a wonderful job of explaining it. I don't need to do any more on that, but this is really important for you to understand that this itself is an example of how we communicate in community. And actually this is one of the first tools that we created to help our teams simply describe what is the problem that we're trying to solve. So in, last, in the last uh, or in the first webinar, we actually took a blank version of this and tree and allowed each of the breakout groups to begin to use the, describe the branches for your community or, or whom you serve, the client population that you serve. And, and describe the roots, describe the drivers of adversity in your community. So it is, um, yes, this pair of ACEs suggests more of a traditional view of ACEs, but it's meant to be just a primer for you to think about what is the pair of ACEs that's operating in your community to begin to understand that dynamic between what individuals experience and what our, our policies, our practices, our systems are producing. So with that uh, little bit of background, I wanna go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Jeff Hild, because today we wanna focus specifically on what's in the soil, asking ourselves and examining how we can begin to address what is in the soil, meaning what are the practices and policies that drive that experience, those outcomes that we see on the branches and how we may be able to leverage policy to remedy this. So I'll hand it over to Jeff now, thank you. Thanks, Wendy. And uh, Nicole, we can just stay on this uh, slide for, if you wanna stay on the tree slide for a moment. Um, Cause I, I think I wanna kick off by uh, uh, first spending some time talking about uh, equity and what we mean when we talk about equity in policy. Um, so when we look at the pair of aces tree and we think about equity or the absence of disparity kind of as the, the end goal, we have to first acknowledge the root causes of so many of the features uh, that we see in the soil, things like poor housing, violence, and lack of economic opportunity, those systemic drivers of adversity, as we say in the slide here. If those things are the proximate cause of adversity, the core drivers are really decades or in some cases centuries of public policies designed with the explicit intent of racial oppression or willful ignorance of their impacts. Uh, this reality really requires us to view our policy work through an explicitly anti-racism uh, lens. And I, I wanted to start really by just providing a few principles for incorporating anti-racism into our, our policy work. Um, and, I'm, and I apologize for not having a specific slide here, but it, you know the events of the past week after we had submitted our slides really made it clear we needed to spend some additional um, time here. Um, so here's, here's the principles I would share. Um, first, uh, acknowledging the historical truth of racism and injustice and seeking to redress it through policy change. So we know that, that white supremacy really relies on denying the past. Um, and how many times just over the past week have you heard the phrase, you know, this is not who we are. Um, and, and our policy work is really about acknowledging that, that yes, this is who we are and our work is to confront and change that reality. 
Secondly, anti-racist policies cannot be colorblind, but must meet the specific needs of children, families, and communities of color as identified by those communities. Third, anti-racist policy should actively push back on the narrative of deserving or undeserving groups, and support should be universal to the extent possible and targeted as, as needed. And finally, anti-racist policy should seek to strengthen whole families and communities and resist policies that fracture families of color. We might think about policies in the criminal justice space or even child support or child welfare here. Uh, and I, I would share, and I'll, I'll put this in the chat in a second, a great paper from some of our colleagues uh, at the Center for the Study of Social Policy that they put out at the end of last year called What We Owe Young Children. And it really includes and expands on, on some of those themes. Um, so Nicole, I think we can go to the next slide. You know, I really just wanted to um, you know, include some of those principles as we explore ways to, to actualize that through policy and, and programmatic change. Um, so I'm gonna spend some time uh, talking about policy levers you might consider um, as you work to build cross-sector collaboration and integrate systems to build more resilient communities, address the paradises and advance equity. And I hope to, to frame some ideas of how you can work within and across some of the big uh, child serving uh, programs and systems, uh, touch on a few recent federal policy changes that may be relevant to your work uh, and raise up some opportunities to support efforts to make trauma informed transformations in the sectors um, where, where you work. And after my remarks, we'll hear some concrete examples of how the Oregon team is leveraging some of these policy opportunities and others uh, to address the pair of ACEs. Um, and we have a panel discussion with our BCR Oregon uh, partners. Um, so I'll highlight a handful of potential policy um, levers. And you know, this list is certainly um, not exhaustive, but hopefully touches on some areas where you all work uh, and have some ability um, to influence and advocate um, for policy change. So we can go to the next slide. Oh, one more, please. Thanks. Um, so it's likely obvious to everyone on this webinar, but Medicaid is the most likely public system to have regular contact with young children from low-income families. It also has the most potential to advance equity uh, because it serves so many children of color. So nationwide, we know that more than half of all children of color are covered by Medicaid or CHIP. In California, there are about 4 million, uh, over 4 million children covered, uh, including 57% of Latino children. Um, and we also know that in California, 70% of the children with Medicaid uh, are Latino, which is far and away the, the highest of any uh, state. So ensuring that Medicaid is high performing uh, is absolutely essential to achieving equity. So I'll mention Medicaid in a number of different areas and the Oregon team is gonna to touch on some of these as well uh, in their remarks. Um, but first, uh, early periodic screening, diagnosis and treatment um, or EPSDT. So the CMS guidance um, from HHS says that the aim of EPSDT is to assure that, child, that individual children get the health care they need when they need it. So in other words, the right care to the right child in the right setting. These benefits provide states with the opportunity, in some cases, the obligation to provide coverage and financing for services within the context of well child visits um, that, that seek to promote social and emotional development. So in addition, EPSDT covers further assessment, diagnosis, early intervention, and treatment services needed by families with young children who have risks, delays, and diagnosed conditions. So our goal should be to ensure that all children, but particularly children of color and those at risk of experiencing adversity have full access to all the benefits under EPSDT. And there's plenty to unpack kind of under this umbrella, um, but one area I'd like to raise up in particular is, is the use of high performing family centered medical homes um, that can be linked to others that to supports uh, for children, um, but particularly children exposed to, to trauma or at risk of exposure. So nationwide, we know that only about half of young children are receiving care within a medical home uh, and it's only about 43% in California. Sorry, these are kids um, covered by Medicaid. The numbers are even lower for children of color. And there are a number of levers that can be used to increase uh, access to medical homes for children, uh, including uh, through enhanced payments. Um, additionally, under a, a 2014 CMS rule change, um, with a state plan amendment, states can use the option to reimburse preventative services that are recommended by a physician or other practitioner within the scope of their practice. 
So we do know that Medicaid can now provide reimbursement for some preventative services staffed by a broad array of health and related staff, in, including uh, family specialists or parent educators and others. Medicaid also plays a central role in cross-sector collaborations. So federal Medicaid law requires collaboration with Title V or maternal and child health uh, agencies through interagency agreements and, and data sharing among other items. Uh, and I'll touch on some of those in the, in the next slide. In terms of other Medicaid support for cross-sector collaboration or non-clinical supports, Medicaid can play a key role in partnering with other sectors for neighborhood or population-based models. And uh, you'll hear one example from Oregon. Uh, and I also wanna say a word now about uh, medical necessity uh, because it's often a barrier to prevention and other services. And I know that my colleague Kim will, will touch on this a bit in our policy breakout session. Uh, medical necessity is, is defined in federal law, but is really interpreted and implemented by states. And in terms of serving children, this is a place where policy change at the state level can be impactful. So federal law states that for children, state Medicaid programs cover all medically necessary services uh, within, the cat within categories of both mandatory and optional um, services under the Medicaid statute, regardless of whether those services might be covered for adult beneficiaries. Um, but whether a state has a child-specific definition of medical necessity and what that definition says is important in determining how much of a barrier medical necessity uh, might be in kids accessing an array of services. So we know that only a handful of states have a specific child-only definition. Uh, and one example I'd share of a particularly expansive one uh, specific to kids is from New Jersey, uh, which says in part that services for children should be deemed medically necessary, whether or not they are ordinarily covered services for all their Medicaid enrollees are appropriate for the age and health status of the individual, and that the service will aid the overall physical and mental growth and development of the individual. So I think this is an example uh, worthy of other states in, uh, in emulating. Uh, I also wanted to, to point out um, the integrated care for kids model um, that's been funded uh, by the Innovation Center at the Centers for, for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Um, so this is a model whose goal is, is to explore ways to improve the quality of care for children um, covered by Medicaid through prevention, early identification and treatment of behavioral and physical health needs. Um, and so these grants, which, which got issued earlier this year, um, go to Medicaid agencies who are working in partnership um, with community-based um, organizations. Uh, and seven states uh, receive these grants. Oregon was one of them. And they'll last for seven years. Um, and so I think as these models kind of get up and running, um, we'll see uh, some findings coming out of that that could provide blueprints for other states and even coordinated care organizations and others to better support children uh, and prevent um, ACEs, and you'll see some, some resources for that um, at the bottom of the screen. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so I wanted to touch on some areas uh, related to Title V, the Maternal and Child Health Block Grant, um, and raise up a, a handful of potential opportunities within uh, MCH. Um, so first around cross-agency collaboration, uh, particularly with Medicaid. So the MCH statute requires coordination with Medicaid to ensure better access for screening, diagnosis, and treatment. Um, this coordination is typically formalized via interagency agreements or MOUs uh, that are meant to include mutual um, objectives and responsibilities. Um, these agreements can be avenues for thinking um, beyond kind of technical matters such as payment arrangements, um, but could include things like racial equity priorities, uh, work focused on ACEs and specific types of services to name a few. Um, and and some, poten some potential questions to ask um, when thinking about these agreements and how they might be um, uh, structured to better comport with, with some of your goals are you know, the extent to which uh, the agreement identifies specific uh, populations to serve. Um, how does it focus on specific service areas uh, such as well child visits um, do they identify where and how coordination is expected? Uh, and do they include mention of working with other systems like early childhood or child welfare? And the report you see on the slide uh, is really a wonderful um, resource that includes some of this information I'm sharing, uh, but also spe uh, specific examples from states on how states are using those interagency agreements to further collaboration. Another, way, another area where MCH funds can be leveraged is to support recruitment and training 
um, for community health workers and family or developmental specialists or family navigators and, and working to support and embed these folks in pediatric practices or other settings. So we've seen across our BCR network you know, the effectiveness of deploying these types of positions, particularly when they are recruited from the communities um, they serve. And as discussed in the previous slide, there's also a key role for Medicaid uh, potentially funding uh, these types of roles. And MCH can also play a key role in establishing and supporting systems of care that are, incre that are aimed at increasing uh, the impact and effectiveness of collaborations um, between pediatric providers and child and family serving entities through improved referrals, alignment of services, and connecting families um, with key supports. And I won't dive too deep into this right now, but the, um, the, the report there that we'll, we'll link to in, in the chat um, does provide a number of promising examples of how states are leveraging uh, MCH funds to advance equity um, in particular. And I think there's a great example from, from Rhode Island where they've developed health equity zones um, with community-driven plans of action um, that have been developed with input from community stakeholders and then utilizing braided funds, including MCH funds and Medicaid funds to, to implement those plans. So let's go to the next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the Family First Prevention Services Act or, or Family First, uh, because it prevents it or presents an opportunity to bring together multiple systems to focus on supporting families and reducing the number of children, um, disproportionately children of color who are in out of home um, foster care pa uh, placements. So Family First became law in 2018. Uh, it's currently being implemented with a, a deadline of October 1st of this year. Um, and the law over, overhauled some pieces of federal financing for child welfare. Um, and most relevant to our conversation today is the shift in how Title IV funds can be spent. So previously states were largely restricted to using federal funds to help with the cost of foster care. Um, and, and I say largely because uh, prior to Family First, a number of states, including um, counties in California were operating under waivers, which allowed um, some flexibility for prevention services. Um, but under Family First, states can use those federal funds for a set of prevention services with the aim of keeping candidates for foster care with their families. And they fall into kind of three categories, in-home parenting skills, mental health services, and substance misuse uh, prevention and treatment. So this shift in the focus to prevention, you know, while narrow in what child welfare will actually pay for, you know, is an opportunity for other sectors to partner with child welfare to fill in the gaps and really wrap around services to families. Um, so similar to Medicaid, you know, it's been a struggle for other sectors to partner um, with, with child welfare. And particularly in the case of public health, I think um, there's been uh, a lot of effort made, but still a, a long way to go in terms of that partnership. Um, it's also important uh, as we think about Family First uh, and implementation of it to really match additional supports um, for families that may be eligible um, uh, but, but, but are facing sort of gaps in the supports that, that they need uh, and how we bring additional supports such as housing or income supports um, that require referrals or coordination um, to ensure that those families can actually access services. So using the Paravasis frame, there's an opportunity for states and local governments to think about how to strengthen protective factors at the, the neighborhood level. So while Family First focuses on individual families in their homes, um, some jurisdictions are working to wrap supports around those families in community-based settings. Um, so you'll hear one example from the, um, from the Oregon team, the Fostering Hope Initiative. Uh, and in, in DC, you know, some of our partners have been involved in setting up family success centers. These are funded by the district and are established in parts of the city um, with high rates of substantiated child maltreatment cases, as well as poor um, health outcomes. And so the centers are located in 10 neighborhoods they're run by well-known community-based organizations uh, who first had to engage in a year-long community engagement effort to identify key services and supports to be located at those centers. And importantly, they serve everyone um, in the community and also co-locate a number of district um, agencies uh, on site. So let's go to slide 10. I realize I gotta wrap up here in a sec. Um, 
so as you all continue your work to engage in trauma-informed transformation, I want to raise up a few potential sources of support, um, primarily from the federal level. You know, and as we think about uh, the coming months and year, you know, this really must be a time for healing um, for our families, for our communities, and particularly for children that have been you know, separated from various support systems during the pandemic. Um, so as part of the recent COVID legislation, a number of SAMHSA, that's the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, programs focused on trauma received um, substantial new funding, um, which should allow for a much larger number of grantees in a couple important areas. And one um, I'll share is Project AWARE or Advancing Wellness and Resiliency in Education. So this helps to fund state education agencies as well as local um, education agencies to support trauma-informed training and professional development for teachers, first responders, and others. And a number of our BCR partners have utilized this resource. Um, similar to what was in the, the CARES Act, uh, the last relief package also included um, substantial funds for school districts through both, both formula-based uh, and some discretionary funds. Uh, and I would note that these funds expressly can be used for social emotional supports as well as mental health supports. Um, and so that means that individual districts do have the discretion to use some of these funds to support trauma-informed transformations and supports in schools. Um, but it's really important that advocates and folks in the community actually push for that um, to happen. And I should also mention that um, Head Start, I'm not sure how many Head Start folks we have on the call, but you know, through the Office of Head Start and the National Head Start Association, there's a great deal of technical assistance um, and resources related to strengthening trauma-informed care within Head Start um, programs. And there's actually been a, a pretty significant increase in quality improvement funds um, from Congress that can be used to implement some of those um, ideas, uh, including through partnering um, with other organizations. So I think I'm gonna um, wrap up there for the, for the sake of time and realizing that um, I've thrown a lot of information at you, um, but my hope is really to spur some ideas as you all uh, continue in this work and we'll explore some of these areas with uh, some specific examples from the team in Oregon. Uh, and I would just close by saying that, that we know um, that, that the inequities we see today are really the result of policy um, decisions made over many, many years, um, and that we can proactively use policy levers through an anti-racist and a pair of ACEs lens um, to support children, families, uh, and build community resilience. So now um, you all get to hear from the, the real experts. Um, and so I'm really excited uh, to be joined by Kim Scott, Caitlin Young, and Jim Seymour. Um, they are part of the core Building Community Resilience Oregon team. Um, and we'll have a discussion with Kim, Caitlin, and Jim, uh, and then have some time for, for questions from you all. So as things pop into your minds, um, feel free to enter them into the chat and we'll get to uh, as many as we can. Um, and I think in lieu of formal introductions, um, I'll just ask uh, Kim and Caitlin and Jim um, to quickly introduce themselves at the outset of your um, kind of respective um, remarks. So uh, Kim, why don't we um, start with you? And I was wondering if you could um, provide a quick introduction um, and then can you set the context um, for your work? Um, and I know BCR Oregon has been focused from the beginning on systems and community support. Um, and if you could share kind of why that was the approach uh, and why doing this work is so important, particularly right now. Sure. So I, I'm Kim Scott. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Trillium Family Services. Um, and a founding member, we were the first BCR program uh, that was invited uh, to participate uh, in Oregon. So we're, we're from Portland as our corporate offices. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, in terms of the context of the work, um, you know, the was always amazed at the elegance of the pair of aces model uh, that Wendy and BCR has, has framed because um, so much of our work um, prior to that, I'll, I'll say historically, focused very much on, uh, you know, as a not-for-profit provider, our work focused very much on what we did as a human serving organization and our own activities and then kind of measuring how well we did that and I'm sorry to say, but oftentimes that, that wasn't 
um, that was without considering the context of the lives uh, of people's lives. And so, um, you know, we had an epiphany some time ago that we wanted to be part of an ecosystem that best supported all family, youth, and communities. Um, and we realize that that's not something that um, really uh, can be done in isolation. It has to be done in partnership, in deep partnership um, with others. Uh, and when I say others, particularly the community, I think over the years I've, I've uh, talked to Wendy about you know, how I, I want to show up in community as an individual and as an organization. And I think she's reminded me that that may or may not be important. What's really important is are you showing up in a way that you were invited by community? And in essence, you know, if you're relevant to community or not, really isn't your call, it's, it's through the lens of the community. So when I look at that work and how we think about that, um, it's impacted me certainly as an individual, but in terms of organizationally who we are and how we work with others um, has been profoundly impacted by our connection with BCR and, and this movement. Thanks, Kim. Um, so Caitlin, I'd, I'd like to bring you into the conversation and was hoping you could kind of tell us who BCR Oregon uh, is, you know, how it started, how it evolved, and, and what are some of the key lessons you all have learned uh, along the way? Yeah, it's my pleasure. Hello, um, my name is Caitlin Young. I currently serve as the administrator for BCR Oregon. And I began my career as a mental health therapist, um, as a school-based clinician for Trillium Family Services. Um, so BCR Oregon began in 2016, as Wendy and Kim have both referenced, uh, with Trillium Family Services as the host organization. And Trillium is Oregon's uh, largest provider of mental and behavior, behavioral health care for youth in the state. Um, and for the first several years, we were known by the national team and referred to by the BCR national team as the Portland team. Um, and our cohort was made up of partners from education systems and mental and behavioral health systems. Um, and with the support and the dedication really of the BCR national team and some facilitated processes, of asset mapping and trust building and patience. Um, over the last five years, we've expanded to a statewide network that now includes dynamic partners um, like Oregon Department of Human Services, um, culturally specific organizations such as Self Enhancement Incorporated, uh, mental and behavioral health providers, including Catholic Community Services, um, Cascadia Behavioral Health, we have partners in higher education, public education, and community and business leaders. Um, we also, our membership is made up of some individual representatives from coordinated care organizations and research consultants. So I wanted to share our mission statement. Um, we are Building Community Resilience Oregon is a self-sponsored statewide network that is comprised of individuals and cross-sector partners that seek to improve the health and well-being of children and youth, to strengthen families, and to build more equitable, equitable and resilient communities. Um, so we really seek to foster engagement between grassroots community organizations, community members, and public-private systems to develop that public, that protective buffer against adverse childhood experiences occurring within adverse community environments. So that's a, a BCR Oregon in a nutshell, a little bit of a timeline and how we've evolved. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, Kim, let's, let's bring you back in. And I know, um, you know we've talked some about strengthening systems that children and families interact with while really emphasizing or centering community strengths uh, as well as needs. And I know a good amount of your work has focused in schools. Can you yeah. uh, talk to us about that work in schools, why the focus there, and how uh, community has been involved in that work? Sure, glad to do that. Um, if you can go to the, the next slide that shows, I, I have this kind of messy graph that, that um, actually this, anybody that knows me and comes into my office sees this uh, work, and it's at least, if anything, it creates good conversation. 
So what this is, is years ago, as we were thinking about typically how these not-for-profits operate in this narrowly defined mission environment that over time, I think, becomes marginalized to more of how we deliver on contracts, we started looking at that and saying, that's, that's not who we want to be. We want to be a social impact organization and partner with others in an ecosystem that actually improves community health and wellness. So we started looking at, from Annie E. Casey Foundation, there's this lifetime of development model, starting with pregnant women and giving birth to healthy babies, all the way to the elderhood and the end of life, you know, and everything in between. And, you know, if you, if you look around that lifetime of development, you'll see all of these environmental uh, intersections, you know, education, national resources, institutions, technologies. And at first, I, I, I remember looking at this and was thinking, wow, um, you know, look at all the impacts on a lifetime of development. And I think this was even before I really understood or, or had the language to understand my own privilege. Um, over the years, people have asked me, well, why don't you change those uh, things that circle this to more like the social determinants of health? And, and I haven't because as I, as I look at that, that reminds me as a 63 year old white male, many of those things that are identified have actually supported me and, and advanced the work that I do, have supported me individually, organizationally, but that's not true for everybody. And that's not true for every community. So for me, this started, um, you, you, you have to understand, I was really thrilled to see the elegant model that Wendy came up with around the pair of aces because it really gave me a different language and perspective. But this is meaningful to me because it started this journey of us not just thinking about ourselves in this narrowly defined mission, but this is also a call, call to partner, to collaborate, to look at impact collectively with community and it helps us think about, I, I think, more than just that narrow slice of mental health. For us, this starts to look at health and wellness in a variety of contexts. The school piece, Jeff mentioned, we're in over 140 schools now in Oregon. And we moved from an intensive outpatient clinic-based program to a decentralized model because we felt like being in schools connected us with neighborhoods, children, families, extended families. It allowed us to better understand the context of people's lives. Um, and from a trauma perspective, as we're also an organization taking on uh, learning about trauma and being more trauma informed, you know, this helps us understand what's happening to people, uh, both you know, kids and families being served but also vicarious traumatization and how do we help the helpers? It gives us this, again, this ecosystem kind of perspective that we've always been looking for. And that's given us a profound, I think, skill set to understand trauma, to be connected, uh, to collaborate uh, with, with good outcomes. But, but this kind of thinking then led to, you know, how do we take this even further? So the next slide is a, a program that is a collective impact model uh, that's called three to PhD. Uh, the three and three to PhD actually stands for the three trimesters and the PhD stands for uh, pursuing one's highest dreams. So the three to PhD program was located at Fabian School in Portland, Oregon. Fabian School was an old building that was tattered, falling down, the kids uh, in the program had the highest uh, food insecurity rate of every school in Portland, Oregon. Uh, it's a K through eight, 25% of the kids were homeless by the school district's definition and um, in this crumbling building. And what ended up happening was right across the street from Fabian School is Concordia University and their school of uh, education, college of education. Uh, they became a core partner. Together, they raised funds through a school bond and individual uh, donations. We raised about $50 million, built a new school program, and a core part of that program, the, the heart of this program is the Wellness Center, which includes Trillium Family Services doing uh, behavioral health, mental health services, Kaiser Permanente doing pediatrics, physical health, uh, dental health services, Basics Nutrition, which is making food accessible, nutrition services, 
There's a demonstration cooking area that the whole neighborhood uses. Those, all of those health services are accessible, not just to the children, but their families, the neighborhood. The College of Education placed their uh, college. It's co-located within this building. So what we're doing is we're actually training the next generation of educators and a more trauma-informed um, science, technology, engineering, art uh, type of a curriculum. And so when I look at that, it, it's this model that very much is trying to take into account um, supporting entire neighborhoods, working together. In terms of how the community also played into this and participated, they participated in the design elements in terms of the services and entirely very much involved in the design of the building itself and what children and families needed. So that, that thinking started back with that idea of wanting to be part of an ecosystem, not wanting to be a standalone, singular, not-for-profit. And I would say the next journey on this is, is we're taking more traditional programs like even Psych Res and saying, how do we do collective impact models um, and a, what used to be a safety net program. So we're now talking with Oregon Health Sciences University, basics, nutrition, do, dentist types of services, all on a single campus to support kids and families that have that higher level of uh, need, like in psychiatric residential treatment. So we're looking at these models and saying, how do we create new systems, programs, services, and supports, and how do we better adapt things that, that um, have not necessarily been effective? So for me, this is an exciting time and very much influenced by this uh, BCR uh, process that we've been part of. Thanks, Kim. So let's bring uh, Jim into the conversation. And, and Jim, I know some of the work you've led and supported has focused uh, not so much on individual families, but really on strengthening uh, whole neighborhoods. And I was wondering if you could tell us you know, why you chose that focus uh, and what has, uh, you know, what have some of those initiatives looked like and accomplished? Thank you. I'm just delighted to, to be here today. It was about, well, I can tell you, for, it was August 1st, 2019, when Dr. Alice and um, one of her colleagues at the Center for Community Resilience, uh, Caitlin Murphy, came to, to Salem, Oregon, and we had hosted a gathering, um, this, uh, it was a gathering of community business and education leaders. And um, this, this little uh, slide kind of shows where we're at today from, from that conversation that began um, August 1st, 2019. Um, and, you know, I've always, I've always felt that you, you segment things to develop understanding, but you integrate things to add value. And part of what this slide shows is both vertical integration and horizontal integration. That, that this one of the big challenges that we've always seen, at least I've seen, as with almost 50 years working in health and human services, was that we segmented things, but we were never able to reintegrate them. And so we have this amazing promise, I think. So the, the Seabelt Executive Committee, uh, if you can see it there, it's, it's um, a group of very prominent people in our community who are, have the capacity to bring folks together. Uh, Chief Justice, former Chief Justice of the Oregon Supreme Court, some major philanthropists, some people who, again, people who are very influential. They have sponsored a group of 50 people in our community, again, who see themselves as having great agency. They, they've, um, they're, they're people who have uh, a voice and a lot of influence in our community. And out of, the, out of this conversation from BCR, instead of trying to figure out what to do for other people, they've made this commitment um, and we, to, to, to build these and to support these neighborhood family councils. You can see at the, at the top. And the Neighborhood Family Councils through a process of, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the community cafe type meetings, sponsoring community cafe meetings in their neighborhoods are 
just agreeing that they will listen to and hear and respond to the voices of folks. And we've selected, we originally selected the neighborhoods. We were lucky that Oregon Health Sciences University did a look at um, over 10 years of all the children four years old and younger that went into foster care. And what they found was that we had neighborhoods inside of our community where children were 10 times more likely to end up in foster care than, than other communities. And so that's how we originally started looking at what we called the fostering hope neighborhoods and, and as we're starting to build these family councils. So this idea of listening to neighborhood residents, that it is their neighbors who are calling them together and are hosting these community cafe meetings and the Seabell Collaborative, this group of 50 people really making a commitment to hear what the folks living in the neighborhoods say they, they need and want in, in order to strengthen their families and to make their neighborhoods more resilient and, and great places to live and raise kids. And then this group uh, on the executive committee, who again, I, like I say, they're, they're prominent people in our community, their commitment then to go to policymakers and philanthropists with that information. So we think about that as um, the, the vertical integration, but then alongside of that is horizontal integration. And when we listen to people, the things they really wanted us to address Education, 70% of the kids in these, what we call fostering hope neighborhoods show up for kindergarten, not ready to learn. And they still haven't caught up with third grade levels. We were very concerned. We, our original data was about the child welfare system and the fact that kids from these neighborhoods were 10 times more likely to experience maltreatment and end up in foster care. The people in the neighborhoods were just saying, we don't have housing. You saw that on the um, adverse community environments. Well, all of these things you saw there but they were very, very concerned about adverse community environments and then healthcare. Um, we just had a, a lot of families in our neighborhoods using emergency rooms, kids ending up in hospitals even for what everybody knew were unnecessary visits. And so the, the Seabell Executive Committee has, we, we've been looking at how do we, in some cases helped launch, like the Mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance didn't exist when we started our work. But how can we how can we support these four key collective impact organizations, the Marion and Polk Early Learning Hub? Their main goal is that families are strong and that, that all children show up for kindergarten ready to learn. The Mid Willamette Valley Homeless Alliance, just in the just just eliminating, getting to what we call functional zero with homelessness, especially with family and childhood homelessness. The Fostering Hope Initiative I won't talk about right now because I got a little short video for you in, in a minute that explains that. But then the Marion County Children and Families Commission whose job is to put together this um, comprehensive coherent um, plan that would, would help every child develop their full potential and for families to be strong. And then, this idea of racial justice and reconciliation. I'm pointing here and I realize you can't see what I'm pointing at, but you can see it, it's, it's there on the left side, just below the neighborhood family councils that we, we have adopted and, um, and so appreciate the structure and the support from the BCR Nash, national group. Uh, Jeff outlined a way to approach this that on one hand creates a safe place for people with divergent views to come together. It's safe, but it, that doesn't mean it's comfortable, but, but there's a structure and it, it's, there's a commitment to nonviolence. There's a commitment to seeking the truth. There's a commitment to finding ways to move forward together. And so um, we've, we've, this will help in our effort to, you know, another part of this model is the sense that we have to heal from trauma. We have to promote equity if we're going to build uh, community resilience. And so we are using the BCR model there. So I wanna just pick one of our uh, collective impact initiatives, the Fostering Hope. And if we could just show a quick video, and then I wanna come back and show you some research about the results of that. So if we could show the, the, the video now. 
Great, I will get that ready. And um, both in English, but it has Spanish subtitles if you are listening on the Spanish channel. And then we'll share the links to both of these videos in English and Spanish in the chat. In the neighborhood not far from here, there's a little green house. That's where I live. I'm Michael, and today my mom and dad are bringing my new baby sister home from the hospital. Her name is Sarah. Mom and dad have all the normal hopes and dreams for Sarah, like she could become an astronaut, or a police officer, or maybe even a veterinarian. <laughs> some things that could hold Sarah back. You see, my mom and dad sometimes don't get along very well. Dad gets mad and mom gets kind of quiet. I think sometimes she feels lonely. Mom and dad had a hard time when they were growing up. In both their families, there's a lot of yelling and sometimes even hitting. They don't want to pass that on to Sarah and me, but it seems like it just keeps getting harder. The Santos family lives three doors down from us. They've had some hard times too, but now they're doing great. So what if my wife and I could help Michael's mom and dad become stronger in stressful situations by offering friendship and encouragement? And what if a group of agencies got together and could offer other things like parenting classes, housing help, and counseling? And what if, with the help of our family and other community members, Michael's mom and dad could start to bounce back from their own pain and become more resilient? Which means that when challenges come along, mom and dad won't get pushed over the edge. That's a good thing. And that means they won't pass on all their trauma to Michael and Sarah, so they can grow up with less stress and be more resilient too. So they break this cycle without our family breaking up. Pretty cool, huh? But we can't do it alone. It's kind of like a wheel with some of the spokes missing. We need all of them if we're going to get anywhere. And that's where the Strong Families Resilient Neighborhoods Project comes in. It's designed to promote the five key strengthening families protective factors for families right in the neighborhood where they live. The five key strengthening families protective factors are positive social connections, concrete support in times of need, knowledge and skills development, resiliency, and social and emotional competence. So here's how it works. Eight core nonprofits that provide support services work together to recruit someone from the neighborhood to become a certified community health worker. The community health worker helps develop positive social connections among neighbors, coordinates the support services provided by the FHI partners, and helps the families with resources. All of the partners share one coordinated care plan that keeps partners informed of strategies and progress. But remember the wheel? If all the spokes, all the groups, work together to do what they do best, then the result is that families become stronger and neighborhoods more resilient. Sound good? Good. Now I gotta go play with Sarah. She's my little sister, you know. Contact these core partners to see how you can be a part of strong families, resilient neighborhoods. So one of the things that I want to um, be sure and mention is that our, our government partners, the County Health Department, um, Oregon Department of Human Services, they've been actively involved in this too. And they um, were gracious enough to say, because of the reason we produced this video, we were looking for funding for the, for the cost of the collective impact for the private nonprofit providers. I've got one more slide and I would just like to show you, we were lucky enough to get a $1.2 million research grant to test whether or not, it's, it's one more, there you go, to test whether or not this was working. Our theory of change said that safe, stable, nurturing relationships were the most important, malleable social determinant of all of a child's life prospects and that um, toxic stress was the, 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 the most challenging thing to overcome. So our focus was on reducing uh, parental stress. And this, um, this slide here sort of shows results. Uh, I, I am not a researcher, but I can tell you that 
Um, the grant paid for uh, Pacific uh, research and evaluation out of Portland, Oregon to develop a credible research design. They selected 80 families from our Foster and Hope neighborhoods and 80 families from three comparison, each, each comparison neighborhood. This first part on the left of the graph shows that all of the families, the orange was the comparison and the red was the fostering hope, um, that they, all the families came in with very high levels of parental stress. But you can see over a period of time, over two years, in the comparison neighborhoods, the stress just went up with those 80 families. It's 80 families per neighborhood. But you can see where the stress levels dropped significantly in the in the fostering hope neighbor, neighborhoods and there there are other indicators too about the ability then for parents to learn new parenting skills um, that was just really important here but that's the slide i wanted to i wanted to share with you so i'm gonna i'm gonna stop there there's so much more i'd like to share but um i, I i've got to stop because of the time Thank you so much, Jim. I, I never get tired of, of learning more about the Fostering Hope initiative. Um, so Caitlin, I was wondering if we could turn back to you to kind of take us into the, to the Q&A and uh, maybe tell us what the future uh, direction for BCR Oregon uh, looks like on how you're bringing some of these um, pieces together. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm very excited to share just briefly about a pilot project for Building Community Resilience Oregon in the 2021 calendar year. And the title of this pilot is Building Community Resilience in Affordable Housing. And it's actually a shared venture between the Fostering Hope Initiative sponsored by Catholic Community Services that Jim just described and Trillium Family Services model of school-based prevention mental health services. Um, when we learned of this grant opportunity that's actually funded by the CCO Pacific Source, um, we realized internally within our BCR Oregon partnership that we would really be stronger together. And historically, when community benefit initiatives or grants like this came came to our attention, our programs would be competing with one another for the same bucket of funding. And so this is really, it's unique. I, I would like to highlight the, the uniqueness of our collaboration um, and really tapping into the strengths of each um, program that has already been proven to be successful in ways in, in the various communities that we're serving. So essentially for this program, we'll be adding um, what we're calling mental health resilience specialists to the um, affordable housing communities where these resilience specialists will be partnering with community health workers and attending the community cafe meetings and, and delivering mental health prevention level mental health services based on identified need within the community. So in some of these community cafe meetings, we've already learned that there's a request for parenting support resources or things like um, really just identifying and working through big feelings kind of on a global scale from things like anger management to managing overwhelm or stress. Um, so we're really excited to be, it's not, it's not going to be prescriptive, it's really not a one-size-fits-all, it will be community by community showing up in partnership to learn how it is we can support um, the residents in these affordable housing communities. So I will leave it at that, but in my breakout session I will be discussing more about this pilot program and also the ways that we've adapted or transformed practice to um, to meet specific community needs, both in public housing, affordable housing, and in um, school communities. Um, so, the, so the good news is you get to learn more from our BCR Oregon uh, partners um, via three uh, breakout groups. Um, so the first one uh, will be related to collective impact. Uh, Jim Seymour is going to lead uh, that one and share some lessons uh, for coalition building. 
Um, the second uh, group is related to practice transformation uh, and Caitlin uh, Young is gonna lead that one. Uh, and then the third one is a policy group uh, that Kim Scott and myself uh, will be facilitating. Okay, so I, I think we just wanted to provide a space um, for any sharing out um, from the groups, um, kind of anything that, that um, really hit for folks that they think, uh, you know, the rest of the, the team here um, should, should hear about. So why don't we just do uh, perhaps a, um, a little round robin, um, maybe just starting at the top with the collective impact group um, and uh, Jim, welcome you um, kind of sharing uh, anything out from, from the Collective Impact Group um, or other uh, folks who are part of that conversation. Uh, any, any items that um, really popped for you? I'd, I'd sure love to hear from people that were um, participating. Um, you know, one of the comments that, that I remember is just the sense of how do we get started? And um, you know, the, 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 the sense I, I was talking about it, of having a theory of change that's grounded in credible science and the uh, amazing work that, um, that BCR National does and the invitation to participate with them, it gives you a, a real sense, you, you know you're you're progressing in a way that's grounded in credible science and it gives you a, you know, so then start where you are and bring people together and figure out what you can do and then and bring, and then also what, what would be the next thing that we'd like to do if we had the resources because ha having a group of people that are listening to folks and honoring the folks that um, have the, that are experiencing the, the adversity the disparities. Uh, it's just it's just a very powerful, you know, resources just just flow to that. Um, the other thing that, that I would just say in that is BCR has created a safe place for exploring. This this way of approaching it, it creates a safe place to explore those questions um, together not comfortable, it's very uncomfortable, but safe. And, you know, I, I, I was hearing somebody else just as we came back that, you know, this, this is about personal transformation. I think um, that, that we, you can't give what you don't have. And so, so creating these safe places where we can deal with our own questions um, in a way that is grounded in credible science and we, we can predict that it's gonna to lead to positive results. So, uh, but that's just me and I'm not even sure how well I reflected the group. I would love it if anybody from my group would be willing to share something that you would, would you, you felt represented our work. I, I'm I'm happy to share. Um, I was with Jim's group, and Jim, thank you. I think you did a really nice job in um, sharing collective impact to those of us who were um, not very well versed in it. But I think one thing that really stood out for me was the value of bringing the voices of the clients that we're serving into the discussion. Um, I think that's where we tend to. I, I run a nonprofit, and. I, I humbly say that I've learned the hard way. We come in as heroes. We're going to serve you. We're going to do this for you when we don't know. <laughs> we, we have the script and we've been told by other communities maybe what people want. But I think the biggest value when we started asking our clients to be a part of advisory groups, um, initiatives, having their voice at the table, that's the biggest most powerful impact I've, I've seen in my own work. And I can see, Jim, what you have done in Oregon, that when you're empowering the voices and ultimately as a nonprofit, you should be wanting to be out of business. And, and that goal is achieved when you teach your people, your clients, those people you're serving, how to serve themselves. So 
that, that was a big piece I got out of our group. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Melissa. I love that summary, summary, Melissa, and just point out folks, Stephanie baron Lou wrote, I thought, a nice uh, summation of some of the key elements of our conversation as well in the chat. And I just wanted to highlight um, one of the points that Jim made was the importance of real tangible benefits. So when we do work with community and when the community does voice its dreams, wishes, desires, needs, et cetera, that we can actually bring things to the table. And Jim made the point that sometimes those are relatively simple. They're not always expensive. Um, I know from our experience uh, with Live Oak Cradle to Career, that's been really center and really important. So I just wanted to emphasize that point as well. Anybody else? Thank you. Thanks, Jim, and, and thanks for others for, for sharing. Um, Caitlin, from the, from the Practice Transformation um, group, uh, anything that, that you'd like to share, others that participated with you uh, would like to bring to the, to the full group? I will tee up the prompt and, and wonder if there's anyone who is part of the discussion that would like to chime in. Um, we did look at an appreciative inquiry approach to practice transformation and to building partnerships across sectors. Um, and with community. And there were some really lovely examples that were highlighted of, um, you know, things, partnerships that are already highly successful and excellent communication happening across networks locally. Um, we also discussed ways to collaborate and leverage our existing effort um, here in this particular ACEs Aware series. Um, and Nicole Lezen added to the chat an upcoming event um, that could be helpful as a way to, as a way or a place to streamline some of these efforts and ideas so that they're not lost. And I'd love to open it up. Other participants in, in this practice transformation group, anything you'd like to add or share? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight what's going on in Watsonville as a model for collaboration across the environment and health divide, which in my opinion is deeply pervasive and deeply problematic. So I think looking towards the future, the reality of climate change, I think it's much more important for us to prioritize transcending that artificial divide so that we can think of a more harmonious balance between people and planet and really highlight places where that's ongoing and see how we can bring that to scale. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. I was feeling encouraged by an opportunity to reflect on how a lot of our collaborative efforts kind of rooted in a, a, a greater commitment to equity have meant that we are breaking our silos down more and starting to um, really realize the holism of the need for housing and nutrition and um, safe schools and, and that it's all interconnected and related. So that was a, a nice validation. And um, I appreciated Rhoda's um, comment, how important is our collaborations need to have a trauma-informed lens as we move forward. Thank you, Jane. One other thing um, that I think was a really great idea um, because we do have, I feel like uh, I work for the county and there's definitely a perception that we're not great collaborators, although we definitely do our best. And I think there's lots of places where we shine and certainly uh, the COVID pandemic and public health's response for the whole community has been one of those great areas. But uh, one thing that Julie uh, in our group had mentioned was like any way we can align the efforts since we're all such busy professionals, because we do have some really broad scope collaboration so that we're not kind of creating a new meeting for everybody that could be better met in this already existing collaboration. Thank you.
All right, Jeff, I think I'll turn it back to you for a debrief on the, the policy session. Great, thanks. Um, so a lot of uh, what's been raised actually um, resonates with our conversation uh, in the policy group as well. And it, you know, we spent um, a fair amount of time um, really diving into uh, community engagement, how we center community voice. I mean, I think not just you know, engage with community, but actually listen to them um, when we make um, policy decisions. Um, and you know, Kim, I'm I'm wondering if uh, if you'd want to share any um, reflections from the from the conversation. I mean, it it really um, I think just hit home for me um, again the need to be um, involving community at every stage of our work, um, from hiring to implementation to planning, um, et cetera. So uh, I'd welcome your uh, reflections or anyone else um, from our group as well. I, I, Jeff, I, I think the, at the end of it, uh, when Leah brought up, you know, how are we connecting, you know, family voices and lived experience and community members in, not only in the design, but in the work, how are we looking at them in terms of being additive to the workforce and, um, you know, the future, I guess, of, of healthcare and uh, health and wellness. And I think those uh, kind of designs and that kind of, those kind of models really need to be incorporated in terms of how we, we think about work. I, I did share we're early on in some conversations with some CCOs and other partners about you know, how do we start um, pathways uh, for youth and community members that want to move into this world of healthcare. There's going to be a need of healthcare work. So what are the university uh, partnerships that we have? What are the investments? Can the, can the not-for-profit uh, sector, can we be kind of that system for um, uh, work experience and development? So I, I think there's some long-term designs and models that, um, that, you know, this helped kind of uh, concretize that thinking for me in this session. So I, I thank everybody for that. And we have a lot of uh, great comments um, in the chat. And uh, one I'd raise up from, from Leah was uh, working in a way to, to get to a point where the conversation isn't community and us, um, but ensuring that there's overlap in both paid and unpaid participation. And I think this really raises a key point of you know, when we ask community members to work with us that we pay them for their time, right? Um, if you're coming to a meeting, you should be compensated for your time and that the the wisdom that folks in community are sharing um, is just as valuable as uh, the wisdom from a PhD or a JD or whomever um, with the credentials. And, and we need to reflect that in, in our organizational um, policies. But I'm wondering yeah. if any, any anyone else from from the from our group wants to to chime in. Uh, Jeff, I just wanted to build off of what you just said about the you know basically that is at its heart what you're talking about is equity in action, and um, you know oftentimes and what we've started to do in our work with our community partners is even in forums like this if we are going to. Um, rely on the community wisdom and part of the grants that we um, apply for, you know, everyone always puts like community engagement and usually that's like just maybe like a $20 gift certificate or some, or to pay for food costs or things like that. And what we are pushing back to our funders is saying, no, explicitly, we um, want to allot for the compensation and, and adding a line in the grant request that actually is covering salaries for community members. And, um, and it's a way also to change the thinking when we talk about equity in practice and in programs and policies, but it's also like showing a system, um, like this is the way that you do equity work in community. Um, and so it's by example that we can, you know, kind of give that example of, creating or, or, or removing like the power imbalances there. So it is, it's not just theoretical, it is something that we all have the ability to do and because we all sit here and write grants and it's a way to really enter into a conversation with philanthropy 
because oftentimes philanthropy in itself perpetuates this power imbalance and perpetuates this inequity, despite the fact that we're, you know, supposedly doing good for good for with community with nonprofit dollars. So I just, I really wanted to stress that because I know so much of the work that you all do in community is dependent upon grant dollars, but there's a way to use that um, to, to balance the, the power imbalances that we see in community through engagement. Thanks, Wendy. And, and I just wanted to, to read something that um, Francine had entered into the chat. I think this is actually a nice um, tee up for, for some of what our team is gonna talk about on the next session. Um, but she says uh, three questions to ask. Uh, who is making the decisions? Whose power does it build? And are we being conscious of intent versus impact? And is the overall impact social justice? Um, and I, I think that um, you know, really uh, hits on how we all need to be thinking um, within our, our work in our, in our organizations. So Wendy, I don't know if you have any um, other closing uh, thoughts you wanna share before we, we turn it back over to, to Nicole and, and David. No, I, you know, other than to say, I just really appreciate the time that um, all of you are spending in the thoughtful implementation of the ACEs screening and really thinking about not only how you are interacting with community, but really being thoughtful and intentional about how you will connect across sectors. I know the pair of ACEs framing, um, many have cited that as a way to help us think about beyond just the individuals that we serve, but really the context in which our services are being applied. And I hope that through this conversation today, it reinforces the importance for us to remember that we are part of that community context. And so what are we doing to contribute to the quality, the nutrients that are in that soil? Um, and, you know, as Jim said, it starts first with the introspection and being true to ourselves um, about you know, whether it was by intent or non-intent, but are at the, at the end of the day, are we really truly serving our community and, and being honest about how we can better partner with community to address the pair basis. So I just thank all of you for holding this space for this conversation, but more importantly, being intentional about how you will create a pathway towards equity and healing for your community. Thank you both, uh, Wendy and Jeff and everyone from the Oregon team. I, I, I can see from the comments in the chat that this was really um, informative and valuable and giving uh, a lot of people some great ideas and a lot for us to continue working with um, here in Santa Cruz County. And, um, as Jeff mentioned, our next session will be the third uh, session that the uh, CCR team is going to present for us. And I think we've been really building up to this uh, next session on connecting ACEs with equity and resilience. And uh, we just opened up the registration for that today. Um, you'll see a link in the chat. And so really encourage you to register for that. I know some of you have been um, attending uh, you know, the first session, now this one, we really hope that some of you will return for that third one because I think it's this kind of, um, you know, building shared knowledge and commitment and uh, that's how we start to change practice in a larger systems in our community. So we look forward to seeing more of you next month. Um, and you'll also see posted a link, two links to a feedback survey for today, um, one in English, one in Spanish. We really would uh, love to get your feedback about these sessions. It'll help us as we plan for future ones. Um, and again, we'll be sharing the recordings and resources um, from today. Within a few days, it may actually take us a little bit longer since we have multiple recordings to try to uh, compile together. But just wanna say thank you to everyone for, for being here. Um, thank you, Wendy and Jeff and Kim and uh, Caitlin and Jim for joining us as well and for sharing all your valuable time and expertise. And great to see everybody else here on the on the meeting as well today. Thank you.